Okay, hello, uh, everybody. My name is Michael Campbell. I'm a biologist and uh, environmental scientist interested in birds. I've published some articles and journals and books in, and books on birds. And today I'm going to look at uh, <clears throat> the biogeography and evolution of eagles. I'm going to describe firstly what biogeography means and what eagles mean and what evolution means. So eagles are very large topics. I'm not going to look at every detail about eagles, but certain main topics that are currently important in terms of research. So firstly, the biogeography and the uh, evolution of eagles. And then I'm going to, uh, so firstly, I start with what birds are we studying? I mean, in other words, what are eagles? Eagles overlap with many species like hawks, kites, buzzards, and even vultures. So we have to know what we mean by an eagle. And right now the jury is out on what an eagle is. Eagles vary in so many physical and uh, behavioral features that not everybody agrees on what an eagle is. So what is an eagle? And uh, you can interrupt me if you can't hear me clearly. I'm speaking from uh, British Columbia in Canada. So and over here it's 10 o'clock in the morning. So I hope you can hear me. If anyone can't hear me, you can contact uh, Derek Keats and tell him, or me and tell him, and then uh, tell us, and then we'll try to change the system. But what is an eagle? An eagle, the main issue is the size and strength of the eagle. Most very large hawks are considered eagles. Some eagles, like the bald eagle in Canada, are considered related to kites. And other eagles, like the African fish eagle, are considered related to vultures. So there's a, a lot of diversity there. But the main issue is that an eagle should be very large and very strong, despite the overlaps with other species. So those are size differences, the main difference between an eagle and, and other raptors like hawks and kites. Eagles usually have much larger bills or beaks and more powerful claws. Their eagles are usually smaller than very large vultures, but they are very strong, with have very strong claws, whereas vultures have weaker feet and weaker bills. I have some pictures here, I hope you can see. This is the bald eagle. It's very common in North America from Alaska to Florida. And it's a very large bill, even though it feeds mostly on fish. So you can see this is not a hawk because the bill is very large. The bald eagle can use such a large bill to kill a lot of animals, can even kill a cat or a dog. This is unmistakably an eagle. Very few hawks have such large bills. So the large powerful bill is a more, very important differentiating factor for all eagles across the world, even though some eagles are smaller and overlap in size with larger hawks, such as a red-tailed hawk or the common buzzard. This is another feature of the eagle. It's a very strong hooked bill and a strong posture. You can see this is the crowned eagle of Africa. It has a very powerful bill. It's capable of killing antelopes, deer, and monkeys. And that's a very powerful bill and a strong neck. It tends to have what may be termed a regal an, an arrogant uh, outlook. It sits still and looks you clearly in the eye. This is plainly not a hawk, but looks like a bird with a domineering character. Then also we've got very powerful claws or talons. This is the feet of a bald eagle in a Canadian zoo. It feet, uh, the claws are clearly, clearly capable of killing any mammal. And that's very rough feet for killing fish or grasping fish out of the water. These claws are much larger than those of any hawk in existence or any kite or even any eagle. None of them have such a powerful grip. And this is very important for the biogeography of the eagle because it determines where it's found and the kind of prey it can take and also how it's evolving to cope with certain prey animals. And this is a feat of the crowned eagle which is being used for falconry. You can see the claws are nearly three inches long and very, very powerful to the point where the owner of the eagle has to wear gloves. Another feature of the eagle is powerful, large, powerful wings, usually very broad wings for heavy lift. Many eagles weigh quite a lot. An eagle may weigh up to 15 pounds, sometimes more. So it has to have very powerful, broad wings for very strong uplift. The eagle is also going to kill prey and have to fly off the ground with prey weighing about five to 10 pounds, which means the eagle's weight and the eagle's um, um, prey both have to be lifted by wings. So therefore eagles do not have weak wings or even narrow wings like falcons or seagulls. 
but broad wings like vultures for rapid uplift when it's killed its prey. This uh, Veraxis eagle of uh, West Af of uh, Africa in general, West, East, Southern Africa, but mostly East and Southern Africa, the large black eagle, and you can see the shape of the wings, very wide in the middle part of the wing and very large tail. This is for killing antelopes and large rodents and sometimes birds to, and to lift up off the ground. So that's, those are the three most important definitions of eagles. The wings, the claws, and the beak. I've distinguished them from other birds of prey, including vultures. But eagles must also be defined by plumage. So plumage means it's feathers. Many eagles have brightly colored feathers, or they are colored like hawks, but we have a crest on their head. So the eagle may be defined by its plumage, and it's also defined by its preferred food. Eagles tend to eat three things fish, mammals, or birds. The bird one is usually their bread or they are, if they've evolved, to have long toes and long claws and rapid flights to kill birds. Mammal eaters tend to be big and bulky with very strong claws. And fish eaters have scaly feet. So the food the, the eagle eats may define how it's evolved. The, f the fish eaters are called sea eagles, like the bald eagle. And the mammal eaters are like the harpy eagle of South America, the Philippine eagle of Asia, and the crowned eagle in Africa. And then those which eat birds are like the golden eagle and some of the hawk eagles in Africa and Asia and South America, which fly very fast and have smaller feet. And the, so the eagle may also be defined by habitat, which is forest or savanna, in uplands or lowlands, and by its genetic background. It's evolved out of a kite or a hawk. So these are the main groups of eagles right now, according to modern definition. True eagles, like the golden eagle, which are divided, in, are usually uh, put within booted eagles. Booted means that its feathers go all the way to its feet, rather than stopping halfway. So it looks as if it's wearing trousers or boots, rather than the other eagles, which wear, looks as like if they're wearing shorts. Hawk eagles are a large, the largest group, a lot of large to medium large to smallish eagles, and usually with crests found in all the continents. And then the harpy eagles are very large. The snake and serpent eagles eat reptiles and uh, um, lizards, and the sea and fish eagles eat fish. So these are the six main categories of eagles currently used for definitions. Now, the plumage of the eagles, as I said, varies greatly. These are two eagles that have very distinctive coloration. This is the Stellar Sea Eagle, which is the heaviest eagle in the world, found in Eurasia all the way from Russia to Japan. And it has distinctive white um, and black plumage, plumage and a very large yellow bill. We've also got the Betula Eagle in Africa, which has bright red coloration and it's characteristic head with bright colored, colored feathers. So plumage distinguishes many eagles. Very few hawks have such distinctive coloration. And you can see in this picture, the, the, if you can see clearly, the Betula eagle also has red feet with scaly legs, scaly feet for killing um, reptiles. And then Stellar Sea Eagle has scaly feet as well, it's scaly yellow feet for killing uh, fish or grasping fish. These are some other eagles, these are hawk eagles. And you can see on snake eagles, I mean. And uh, you can see the snake eagles vary a lot. They're much smaller, but they have crests on their head. They're much smaller birds. Eagles vary to a great extent in size. And these eagles here are barely bigger than a, that, than a, a hawk, like the red-tailed hawk or the gosh hawk. But these have powerful feet for killing snakes. So they are very powerful birds and might be stronger than a red-tailed hawk or a gosh hawk because they can kill large snakes. So the black-chested eagle is quite common. And you can see it has very small feet, but they're very powerful. Also the booted eagle, it has feathers all the way down to the feet, but it's capable of killing snakes. So these are some of the smaller serpent eagles and uh, snake eagles, but they're still eagles. They still have mark, have the characteristics of an eagle. Powerful feet, a specialized life for killing particular animals, powerful wings, and unlike many hawks, they have a crest on their head. This, this, are, this is a hawk now, a forest buzzard. And you can see the difference between them and the eagle, the, this and the eagle. A smaller bill, it's a smaller bill and a smaller bird. It's more lightly built. It's, it may be mistaken for an eagle, but it's much more lightly built, less powerful wings, 
the feet are smaller and the bill is smaller. This is also the step buzzard. You can see it's somewhere between the size of an eagle or appearance of an eagle and a much smaller bird. Small beak or bill and small feet. This may not be able to kill the kind of snakes or fish that eagles eat. It tends to go after small rodents and mice, like mice and small birds. So that's how their step eagle looks. The yellow-billed kite has been mistaken for an eagle before, but it too is too small to kill the kind of prey eagles kill. It's not as compact and powerful and muscular. It's more lightly built. So that's one of the main points about the evolution of eagles. If some birds have evolved out of hawks and kites that have superior power in killing larger prey, Consequently, maybe they got larger because of the greater abundance of food. Now, the other thing eagles must be distinguished from, the other birds, set of birds, eagles must be distinguished from are vultures. Vultures are usually the size of eagles or even bigger. This is the lappet faced vulture, which is larger than possibly any eagle. It has a very large bill, but its feet are not powerful enough to kill prey the way the eagle can. An eagle the size of the lappet faced vulture a wingspan of about nine feet would easily kill a large dog. But the eagle is not that big, but has much more powerful uh, talons. And the bill is not just for tearing dead animals, but for killing. So in a fight between the lapid fish vulture and, for example, the golden eagle, the golden eagle might win despite its smaller size, but much more powerful bill and claws. So even though many eagles are related to vultures, they've evolved different for killing rather than scavenging. And that applies to the, the griffon vulture as well in this picture, or which is a white back vulture by one of the griffons. And it has much weaker feet and a much weaker bill. It's not in the same league as an eagle, even though it's as big as a golden eagle or even larger. So that's the description of where, what we are studying, eagles. And that's their character. It's not very definitive as to what eagles are and how they developed, but the eagle is a strong bird it's very powerful for killing certain kinds of prey, and it stands out among the birds of prey in strength and compared with the other hawk's size, and in compared with the vulture's powerful killing ability. Now, I said, I mentioned that this, this seminar is called the Biogeography and Evolution of Eagles. Biogeography is a study of the distribution of life forms and the factors for the distribution. So the next topic is, will be how or what factors determine the distribution of eagles. That's a, a, a physical environmental issue, but it's more and more or less, um, and more and more uh, attached to people, how people modify the eagles' habitats and the prey that they eat. Evolution is a change in forms through time. So we'll look at that. And even though everybody knows eagles have evolved over a long period of time from other birds of prey, I'll be looking at recent changes, which are determining how eagles adapt. One of them is eagles adapting to human beings. That overlaps biogeography and evolution. Now, the main issue for eagles is how their strength, um, size, and the form evolved from smaller ancestral raptors. That's the main the early evolutionary problem. How did these big birds, and why did they come about? How did they evolve from smaller birds, and why did they come about? Some scientists say it's because during the Ice Age and just after, there were a lot of larger mammals around and some birds were able to kill them and become larger as they killed the larger mammals and birds, whereas some other birds specialize on small mammals and small birds. Now, the eagle's evolution at this period could be termed convergent evolution in some cases. So that convergent evolution is when life forms that are not related or not closely related independently evolve into similar forms. So kites can get larger, hawks can get larger, and even vultures can become larger, and all of them can turn into eagles, which look similar, but are not actually related. Like the bald eagle may have come out of a kite, a fish-eating kite, and the golden eagle may have come out of a hawk. So in such a case, the bald eagle and the gold eagle look almost similar, but they may have had an independent beginning, and that's convergent evolution, converging towards a point from opposite ends. Kite and hawk groups may both create two very similar eagles. And that's my diagram, my model in the in the illustration. And that is what has bedeviled a lot of uh, geneticists over time. Buzzards can turn into eagles. There are birds called buzzard eagles that look like buzzards and look like eagles. There are some that look like kites and look like eagles. And there's some that don't look like anything else, the crested head. 
like the happy ego. Where did they come from? How did they get so big? Because a bird is big as happy ego cannot easily kill small prey. So where did they come from? Which species did they come from? Or what common ancestor do they have? Do they have, do they have a common ancestor or many ancestors? Then when they have only one common ancestor, they call monophyletic. A group of species share a common ancestor. That means they all came from one area. That's obviously not the case in eagles. Small classified groups of eagles, like the hawk eagle, might be in such a situation. But in commonly, they think the eagles are polyphyletic, which means a group of species are described from, uh, derived from more than one common evolutionary ancestral group. And then, in terms of evolution, is eagle ecology uh, undergoing current change? Yes, it is. But that's mainly because of people. People are the reason why eagle ecology is uh, undergoing change right now. Then a recent recent trend called uh, mostly within animal geography, but also within behavioral ecology is to what extent are eagles adaptive? Are individual eagles different from each other? Anybody who, who has had pet animals knows that animals vary in behavior at the individual level. Some eagles adapt better than others. Some don't. Even within the species, some bald eagles learn how to kill cats and specialize on that. Others kill only dogs. Some continue killing fish. They vary at the individual level. And that's a very important area of research in current uh, ecology and also uh, fields like animal geography and some branches of even sociology. And then uh, in addition to the tools it, the eagle uses, usually fall within to change, usually fall within uh, foraging, nesting habits, population characteristics, breeding, and migration. Those are the areas they look at if they want to see birds are doing individual habits. Some eagles don't migrate. Individually, they just stay at home. Some individually take different migration routes. So at the individual level, eagles vary in choices of nest. Some eagles nest on rooftops or in, on, in, on uh, telegraph poles or even on the ground, individually even though they generally the species nest in trees or on cliffs, you might find one eagle nesting on top of a skyscraper. They tend to vary in that sense at the individual level, not the species level, but at the intra-species level, which means individuals within a species vary, not just between the bald eagle and the gold eagle, but within the golden eagles, there's a lot of variation. There have been cases of eagles nesting on rooftops and even on top of cars. And then another thing about the eagle evolution and its change in biogeographical distribution has, has to do with its size. Did they evolve from smaller species or larger ones? The largest eagle in history that we know of is called Hast's eagle, which was nearly about five feet long. And then there are some smaller birds that look like ancestral to the eagles. So some eagles got bigger, some got smaller. One of the reasons for this is that is the prey. If there's a lot of big animals around, it's, the eagles may get larger and larger. If they're only small animals and the big animals get extinct, eagles may get smaller and smaller. And then they adapt accordingly. And as I've said already, the lineages are many hawks and kites. That's those are the main lineages. The distinction be between biogeography and evolution becomes blurred because as the eagle evolves, it also tends to change its distribution according to the food it eats and the habitat it lives in. So biogeography is changing and the bird is evolving in a different way. So you're going to find biogeography and, uh, and uh, evolution enmeshed when I'm talking about these uh, animals. And then of late, scientists have been reclassifying eagles to the point where the name even changes. Because of the things I've discussed, the e scientists reclassify uh, the eagles. Formerly it was called something else. Then it changes its name. Some are due to genetics, some are not. For example, the Philippine eagle used to be called the monkey eating eagle. Now its name is changing. So this also, and this also the white headed eagle used to be called the sea eagle or the gray sea eagle. So there's some changes in these birds, the name changes and some eagles even have many names uh, depending on where they classify them. The, the Veroxys eagle in Africa is also called the African black eagle. There are several other birds in Asia and South America called the black eagle. And some used to be called uh, something else like buzzards. Now, a very important issue that's emerged in this team recently has been the creation of the genus Nicetus, or 
a section of hawk eagles found in Asia. They've, they were formerly in the genus Spizetus, which is found in the Americas and Asia. But recently, the scientists reclassified their, those in, this, in Asia into a separate genus, a separate genus entirely, and put them in and call this genus Nicetus. They found they were different. They have similar ecology, but they all live in Asia and they eat similar food, everything's similar, but they found they were not the same. They may not even have a common ancestor. That's the difference between Nicetus and Spizetus. One is in the Americas, one is in Asia. They're similar, they look the same, but they actually were different and may not have the same common ancestor. But the ecology they live in is similar and the prey they take is similar. The forested South America and forested Southeast Asia. They used something called mitochondrial DNA sequences. That's what made this happen. They, when they go more advanced, not just the physical appearance of the bird, but they go into the mitochondria and the DNA sequences in the bird. Then that's when they find a totally different kind of bird. So this having et al, or a group of scientists, said they clearly indicate some external similarities were there, but internally the eagles were different. So that may be convergent evolution. Actually, one set of birds in Asia and another set of birds in South America evolved to the point where they look really similar. So people were tricked into believing they were the same, but they're not actually the same. They're different. And this is a very important point for eagle evolution. And now this is the list of all the birds that I, I mentioned in Nicetus and Spizetus. They're quite a lot. You don't have to look at all of these in detail, but it shows that they, even the Nicetus group was larger in number. They are all called hawk eagles, but they've been moved into the Asian uh, group, Nicetus, and there are more of them. They mostly have crested heads, but they don't have similar DNA. So this is, uh, the South American group is right now just about four or five, there's a dispute on that. But the Asian one is, well, is nearly 10 or even more. But they tend to vary every now and again. So because of that, we've distinguished between the two. Now, the main thing I mentioned about uh, eagle evolution and their local biography is the perception of eagles being individually variable. There's individual behavior and eagles. And one recent cutting edge research project that discovered this was the tendency for some eagles individually, not at the species level, but at the individual level, to become monogamous. Monogamy means that, I'm sorry, to become polygamous. Eagles are normally monogamous. Monogamous is when uh, the species breeds one male, one female, and they pair for life. Or they may shift partners when one of them dies, but it's entirely one male, one female. Like that, similar to that, for example, the tiger. Male tigers and female tigers breed in pairs. One male, one female. Polygamy is a case where there's many females and one male. So for example, that could be like the lion. Lions tend to have one to three males cohabiting with about 10 females. So that's polygamy. Now, unusually, in one case, eagles, some Indian spotted eagles were discovered with a male with more than one female breeding, with the male moving back and forth between two nests. That was an unusual situation and may have been based on adaptation that there were not enough males around because of human beings having I mean, modified the environment and make, uh, compelling the eagles to adapt along with the changes that were going on. One author said this shows that eagles think and adapt to new circumstances. There needs to be more research on this individualism in the eagle, that it adapts. And it shows a strange ability to change in the environment, like similar to how domestic animals can change. Wolves, for example, may not be the same as dogs. Dogs have changed a lot because of domestication. But in this case, the eagles changed in the environment without direct human action, only indirect. And this is the story here I put on the screen. Two pairs of nesting eagles were, nest, of eagles were nesting in uh, proximity. And the, the study was based on two male eagles and two female eagles. And then when, um, the, when, the, when the birds, uh, the, the, the environment changed, the, the, the pairs got mixed up. Eventually, one male eagle called M1 was cohabiting with the two females, F1 and F2, with some conflict involved. So that was a study by Sant et al. in 2017 about Indian spotted eagles. This is a very important research, and it's developing a lot of new ideas. 
So I put up a lot of complicated things you can look up later, but with a lot of words you can look through, but it just shows that the pairing of eagles is individualism. So when I when I put this, they put this up on YouTube, you can look at it more and can check out the research. It's very important if you want to research on any eagles in your country or watch and do any bird watching. If you see three birds on a nest, one of them may be a male and two could be females. It may not just be mother and father and child. It could also be father and two mothers and some chicks. So that's a very important point when you're watching birds. Most people assume that if you see two birds on a nest or three birds, it's the mother, the father, and the chick. But it could be the mother, the father, and another mother. And then you see chicks coming. And it could be the females could be on separate nests as well. Mm -hmm. So that's the evolution of eagles at the local level, individually, and also in terms of <clears throat> generalizable species level change. Then there's also the bajok of eagles evolving out of this has to do with more wide ranging characteristics. For example, habitats. How was eagles, uh, persons in varied habitats changing and how do they migrate? Here again, this individualism. Eagles may adapt to different habitats and also adapt to migration routes and how they react to these changes. But the traditional habitats of eagles are, as usual, we know that they are forest eagles, savanna eagles, highland eagles, lowland eagles, and coastal riverine eagles. Those, uh, the forest eagles are usually like the harpy eagle in South America, the crowned eagle in Africa, and the Philippine eagle in Asia. There are savanna eagles too, like the bald eagle, sorry, the golden eagle, and the martial eagle in Africa. And in Asia, there are many, many hawk eagles that live in the savanna. And, and uh, I put up some examples of forest eagles. Crowned eagle, Congo serpent eagle in the Americas, in, in Africa. So Africa, the Americas, and Eurasia have different kinds of eagles. And this is a very important uh, point, but the, all three continents have forest eagles that prefer living in the forest, they live in the savanna, but can possibly adapt out of this. This, they're also, this is the forest habitat. Eagles tend to live in the middle section of the forest. The forest usually is composed of three layers, the understory, the canopy, and an overstory of emergent tall trees. Eagles can usually nest in the tallest trees and forage in, in lower down just above the ground. And I've got three pictures of a demonstration of the levels of the forest, and then also some actual pictures from Africa and South America showing how the forest is. You see the eagles nest in the tallest trees, but they go down to ground level or just above the ground for hunting forest animals. That's called forest habitat for eagles. And then savanna again, we've got eagles. You know what savanna is? Savanna is usually a mixed grass and tree and shrub environment. Here, the eagles will still be nesting, nesting the tallest trees to avoid predators, but we're hunting in the sky over the grass. In the Americas and Africa and Eurasia have such eagles, all three have such eagles. In this savanna habitat, you can see trees there, some shrubs, some grass, and the eagles will be nesting in the tallest tree and then flying over the savanna to get food. Then there's coastal and riverine eagles, like the bald eagle, the stellar sea eagle, and the African fish eagle, fish and, uh, fish and sea eagles. They eat fish near rivers or the sea, and they live in all these uh, contexts but in the nest in tall trees and sometimes on cliffs. But they also have similar ecologies, but they adapt to the different situations. For example, the bald eagle in Alaska, we have a different situation to deal with than the stellar sea eagle in Japan and the African fish eagle in South Africa. They tend to vary a lot in their ecology. So there's some adaptation. Right now, there's a lot of ad adaptation of the bald eagle to the Canadian context. And bald eagles are even nesting in, in Vancouver, the city of Vancouver on buildings. And this is the normal coastal area. I took this picture in uh, Nanaimo in British Columbia. The forest coming all the way to the sea and the eagles were nesting on the tops of the trees and hunting mainly over the water. But they were also adapting and going to places where people were fishing and stealing fish. Now, so that is the habitats they live in. Because of summer and winter and the change in temperature, usually eagles in the north migrate south. And this is where some difference comes in. The eagles have to pick rising hot air to, to fly because they weigh too much to just to flap all the way down to their winter habitat. So they have to take 
thermals. A thermal is an uh, area of hot air rising that can lift an eagle up. And then also this wind over mountains that enables an eagle to fly. So the eagles must choose the thermals and our graphic uh, lift, which is the mountain air lift, to fly from the hot, the, from their winter habitat, from their winter habitat to the uh, hot warmer one in the south. And this is where eagle variation comes in, both in distribution and in, in individuals. Some eagles take different routes to go to their new home, and then different routes to come back. And since thermals form only over land and not the sea. The eagles cannot fly long distances over the sea. They must uh, go through narrow areas where the sea is very narrow. That's called a bottleneck. The Mediterranean Sea, for example, is far too wide for an eagle to fly across. And also the Caribbean Sea is too wide. Even seas like the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea are far too wide. So the eagle must select a place where it can probably see the land on the other side of the ocean. And one way you do this is selecting some very areas where the sea is very narrow and you see large numbers of eagles flying across. In some cases, they can't, like in the case of Gibraltar, between Spain and Morocco, when they're flying from Europe to Africa, you see eagles and vultures falling into the sea from exhaustion, from flapping, but because their air is not hot enough to raise, to create a thermal, to push the eagle up. Of course, if the eagle's big weight, it's so tiring in flying that it falls into the ocean. And that's what a thermal does. And this is what in the picture of a thermal, you can see the hot air is rising above uh, hot ground, lifting the eagle upwards, and therefore that allows the eagle to soar. Since the eagle in the migratory mode is not soaring just to hunt and flying in circles, but going in a line southwards, it takes a lot of intelligence for the eagle to select which part of the land it can fly over, wherever this hot air rises. And that's a very difficult choice. And you find a lot of individual differences between eagles, not just the species, but the individual. Some scientists record, for example, eagles trying to fly from Italy to Africa, just around where the island of Sicily is, where the Mediterranean Sea is very narrow. Some eagles cross, some lose heart and turn back, and some fall into the sea. It varies individually. But in general, that's one of the migration bottlenecks. Italy to Africa, or Spain to Africa, and then also along Syria and Iraq, over the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea area. And in the Caribbean area, some eagles fly over Cuba and then try to go down the chain of islands into South America, or they fly along the Mexican Cordillera down to Panama. So these create great, big troubles for our eagles. Where I'm living in Canada right now, this, um, where I'm living on an island called Vancouver Island, and you see a lot of eagles trying to cross onto the mainland of Canada or the United States around Seattle area. So there's a lot of trouble when the birds are trying to cross. Small birds can easily do it, but big eagles find it different. So it's a very serious problem. And the birds vary in how they can do it. This is our graphic lift. The eagle is going over a mountain and turbulence makes, blows the eagle up and allows it to go over a mountain. For example, like the coast ranges or the Rocky Mountains or the Andes, the Alps, and the Himalayan Mountains all over the world. Eagles must fly over mountains and the wind can lift them up, but not all the time. When there's no wind, strong or graphic lift to lift the eagle up, it may have to cancel its migration for now or find a route around the mountains. And that's where you see a lot of individual variation in the biogeography, biogeography, biogeography distribution of migrating birds. Here's a picture of Spain into Africa. The Gibraltar uh, streets, streets of Gibraltar, is quite narrow. You can see the distance, but it's a, that's quite a job for an eagle to migrate over. Straight across to Morocco, but many birds land in the ocean. But the narrowest point, you can also see in the top picture, Italy. From uh, these birds can go from Italy to Sicily, but Sicily to Tunisia here is going to cause some problem because it's quite a wider than Gibraltar. So you may see some birds dead in the water, and that varies. It varies according to the size of the eagle as well. So in, in any cases, there's a lot of problems. United States, this is Vancouver Island, where I'm living, and so they have to cross across these islands into Washington State from Vancouver Island, and that too is causing a problem. Those are called migration bottlenecks. Another way eagles are adapting is onto f urban forests, green spaces in cities. So uh, in, uh, that's, they're called green spaces or green heart. A green heart is, uh, is where there's a large green area inside a city. For example, a Central Park in New York. Central Park in New York uh, has a large, it's a large green area and birds tend to nest there rather than in the urban area. 
eagles can do the same. And then right now in Canada, they are nesting in many places and causing trouble where they kill people's pets, for example, like cats and dogs. Then they can also nest on electric lines, power lines and power poles, which can kill the eagle sometimes if it gets electrocuted. And eagles also visit urban rubbish dumps, land and landfills, coastal ports, and of course they kill pets. So the eagle is, especially the larger eagle, there's a big issue about various eagles in South Africa as well, and how they adapt to cities. But the bald eagle right now, because it's illegal to kill a bald eagle, the bald eagle's numbers have come really high. There are also eagle issues for golden eagles in Britain, where and white-tailed eagles which have been reintroduced and they are causing a few problems, but they tend to stay outside the city more. This is a picture of juvenile bald eagles on electric uh, lines. Sometimes we can build a nest right on top of this kind of thing, especially where there's cross, uh, cross poles. This is a place for the stability for the nest. And this can cause some trouble. Juvenile bald eagles look like adults, but they tend to have white spots all over and the head is not white and the tail is not white. Now, one way to study eagles is to study them with drones. We study the eagle with drones that can follow the eagle around. So this, um, but there's some problems because recent studies have shown certain eagles at the individual level, certain eagles can attack the drone and get injured or actually bring it down. Eagles interpret the drone as, uh, and as um, a form of uh, a bird or an attacker. So there can be some problems. So these, studying the eagles like this, and eagles on the power lines or in urban context with drones does acquire, uh, create some risks. And also it brings up some privacy issues. These kind of large drones have been noted to cause problems because the, um, <clears throat> they, they have a camera and then this it creates legal privacy issues for people. The legal privacy issues occur because it can also film people in private situations. So it's very difficult to document eagles in urban contexts. And that's become the, one of the main research areas for the <clears throat> study of eagles. The, the urban context where the eagle adapts may not be known. And it does cause some problems, especially the smaller eagles, which you can't easily see. So based on all these uh, issues I mentioned, there are four main key issues that are evolving about the study of eagles. One of them is how to document eagles in their interaction with people and how they change at the individual level. The fact that most bald, the fact that most bald eagles do something does not necessarily mean this individual bald eagle will behave the same. It could behave differently because it's adapting at its own individual level. It may be killing cats. Another bald eagle may be nesting on right on your, on your balcony in an apart, rise, high rise apartment. Another one may be nesting on the roof. Also some bald eagles and golden eagles go into airports and they collide with planes and the airplane can crash. That's a separate issue. Then there's also eagles migrating that cause problems and the scientists are trying to resolve that particular problem. Then eagles also kill wild animals that are valuable. And also because eagles are protect, protected, sometimes they eat carcasses that have been shot and get poisoned with uh, lead from the bullets that people use. Whether you use lead bullets or even copper bullets can cause a problem. So these are major recent issues to do the evolution and the biography of eagles, all mostly happening in the last 30 or 40 years. And people are still researching heavily on these issues. Also, the size of the eagle has become a recent uh, issue. People know that the bald eagle and that, or the golden eagle does not adapt the way that the red-tailed hawk will adapt. The eagle is usually much larger. So what do we need to do? It can't just eat little animals. It may go after livestock like goats, sheep, or pet animal. And we have to know how to deal with this kind of problem. How, what, what happens if the eagle decides to go after much uh, larger animals and harms them, their companion animals, their livestock, and it could bring costs to people. So that is another cutting edge thing. But the main issue for all these things we are talking about is the individual behavior in eagles. Now, as I mentioned, also landfills have become a problem. Urban rubbish dumps, how do we get eagles away from those places? Some eagles go after organic food, like carry on in the landfill area, and they concentrate in those places, which can cause problems if, for example, the landfill is near an airport or near a tourist area. So that's another big problem that's emerging. And then how do we plan the green spaces and greenhouses in cities to make sure that eagles don't proliferate there and wipe out other livestock. And the electric lines are another problem. Electric lines can kill eagles. So there have been a lot of debate as to how to build the electric lines. Should we put them underground 
or should we put them so widely spaced that the ego cannot sit on it, touch two lines at the same time? The fatal consequences usually happen when the ego touches one area and then touches another area at the same time. And the electricity is transmitted to the ego's body from one line to another line. And that's what kills the ego. So if you put the lines very separate, it may not kill the ego. But the egos go for places where they can set so two lines close together or long wings. The wings touch the two and trouble starts. So these are the issues we have to look at. And then the, the problem of the migration I mentioned earlier, it means that people are monitoring birds to see from whether they fall into the sea and to what extent that may cause some problems. A lot of bird lovers don't like seeing birds die in the water. So they, a lot of researchers are researching on how to get birds to cross the sea. They can put resting points between the two ocean places, like a boat or a large ship. The bird rests on the ship temporarily and then flies on if the ship is about maybe three ships in between the two migratory points, between Spain and Morocco, or between Vancouver Island and the United States. They can have some ships there for the bird to rest on, but that costs money. So those are some of the issues that are involved. So as you can see from what we've looked at, the, and studying eagles is very difficult, partly because of their size. It's more difficult than studying small birds like sparrows, because the size of eagle means it has a significant biological and ecological cost with the environment. It affects people in a different way. And because of its high environmental needs, we can mess up the eagle's life more easily than we can mess up the sparrow. The eagle needs big meat to eat. And we take away the meat or poison it, it affects the eagle more than the sparrow will be affected by seeds. And that's one of the reasons why people are researching on eagles. Now, some scientists say that eagles are a relic from the past. They are a relic from the past, from the ice age time when they were big animals and virtually no people. So the massive birds would feed on carrion and large animals, which they could kill and eat. So now in the modern times, the new speculation is that the eagle is so big that it may be going out of history. It's a, it reached its natural end because of the large uh, uh, changes, of, the large uh, significant changes that have happened. Maybe the eagle is getting extinct, is still working towards extinction. So it's our job to make sure that that doesn't happen. Now, I'll just mention one, or, one more thing here about the earlier part I put up to do with the, the habitats of the eagles. How do the eagles adapt to forest change? That's a, another important point, because I mentioned earlier on that they're forest eagles. All these eagles are affected severely by deforestation. Now, the issue is, to what extent can the eagle adapt? Can a forest eagle turn into a savannah eagle? If the forest eagle, like the happy eagle, has no, the forest is fragmented, can it turn into a savannah eagle? Can the happy eagle turn into a savannah eagle, like the chaco eagle? Can the, um, the crowned eagle in the African forest turn into a martial eagle of the forest, of the savannah? Can it share that habitat? Now, that's been happen at the individual level. But scientists are researching on whether, if we change the environment, the eagle can adapt to a new environment, from forest to savanna, or from savanna to coastal areas. We don't know that yet. So that's another future thing that people are writing PhDs about, as to the extent to which eagles at the individual or species level can adapt to a different context at the individual level. And that's a significant aspect for dynamic biogeography, or the dynamic biogeography of eagles. Yeah, so that's made the main things we are, uh, We've discussed about eagles. That's so about you to decide what you think are the cutting edge issues for the future of eagles based on this, these topics. And so that's it. And uh, thank you for listening. I don't know whether you can hear me or ask any comments or say anything. Let me, I think I've shared the screen. Yes. Uh -huh. Let me just get out of here. Yes. Let me just get uh, let me just get this back. Do you need any help there? Yeah, I'm gonna need to get the thing back. Yes. So that's I've just uh, delivered some small talk about the future of eagles. I mean, if it's issues what the eagles are and their future, considering how we are changing things and the recent changes in biogeography and the evolution of eagles, and maybe in terms of adaptation. And the future research we need to do about eagles right now, because most people know about the past for eagles, even though that's disputed. But what about now and how we are changing the eagle's life? Yep. Uh, Derek Keats, are you still in the, in the thing? Yes, I'm still here. Sorry, I didn't realize <laughs> you had finished. <laughs> yeah, yeah.
I had just run across the room for a second when you stopped and I, I came back again quickly, but uh, I think I yeah. missed you. Yes. Yeah, so um, what we'll do now, I think, is if you can stop uh, sharing the presentation, we can put uh, cameras on and uh, um, then just ask people if they've got questions. Um, yeah. So if they can hear me, if anyone can hear me, I'm we now supposed to receive some questions according to Derek Keats. Yep. Um, is your camera still on? I'm not. Uh, yeah, I can. I can see my face. I'm not sure. Yeah. Can see sorry. Sorry. Yeah. It's my um, my view was uh, excluding the cam cameras. All right. So let's see what questions we have. Um, I, I, well, well, we're well. I'm just going through the questions. Can Can I ask a question? So yeah. you were you, you were talking about biogeography, and one one of the areas of biogeography is is vicariance and I'm just wondering, is there sort of good evidence of where the ancestors of eagles or when the ancestors of eagles arose? And given that there is, I guess, convergent evolution in eagles, um, did they arise, you know, like, like, you know, way back when there was Gondwana or, you know, did they rise independently on, on different continents? Uh, how, how does that uh, history work? As it seems right now, the evidence is that eagles evolved in many places from convergent evolution. And the main determinant of the definition of eagle is their size. So where this evolution, birds got larger, size came, and therefore they're classified as eagles. It's some scientists believe that the reason why eagles got larger is during the ice age, before the ice age, when the birds and mammals came up, birds had prey, larger prey to eat, and slowly the birds of prey started to kill uh, smaller animals and eat them. And they got larger. One of the factors for the eagle size is the lack of competition from other predators. So, for example, it's claimed that the monkey eating eagle, the Philippine eagle, became very large because on the Philippine islands there's no competitors. There's no leopards, there's no big cats of any sort. So the eagle dominated the ecology, the predatory ecology. It could kill anything on the ground. So it got bigger and bigger and bigger. The same situation happened in the Amazon forest, creating the harpy eagle and the crowned eagle in Africa. It became very powerful. But the, the, over there, they have, they, have, they have big mammals like leopards and jaguars in South America and Africa, but they do form enough of competition for aerial monkeys, for example. So the eagle got bigger from eating bigger prey and evolved slowly bigger and bigger. It seems many people think that the ancestors of the harpy and the Philippine eagle were smaller. They slowly evolved over the past million or so years as the age of mammals came up and the age of reptiles went down. Large vultures evolved at that time. They're very large skeletons of vultures from that time. But the vultures were mainly eating uh, dead woolly mammoths and mastodons. But the eagle had to kill its prey rather than eat carrion. So their size was not as pronounced as the vultures, but almost got there. Hmm. That's the so main a million, thing. A million years is not very long. That's, uh, that's really interesting. Um, so we've got some questions coming up now. Um, there's one from Elizabeth. Uh, uh, who says, Michael, I'm guessing you were not born in Canada. How did you end up in Vancouver Island? I think that's an interesting story for you to tell. You told it to me. I finished, my, yeah, I finished my PhD in England and I arrived in Vancouver to work at the university. Yeah, that's the answer. I did it. After I finished my PhD in England, I came to work in Canada. So yep. uh, then there's a question from Paul. Um, how I... Who, I need, I'm a, I'm a Newfoundlander, so I dropped my H's. Let me try that again. How high can eagles fly? Uh, so for the record, eagle, uh, eagle uh, uh, altitude for flight is usually around 30,000 feet. If they can go higher than that, but they usually go up because of turbulence or thermals. So they can continue going higher and higher as long as there's oxygen and warm air rising or the wind blows them up. That's usually around, up to the maximum, around 30,000 feet, especially when they're crossing mountains. Some mountains like the Rockies can go up to 20,000 feet. So the eagle has to fly over them for migration. They go higher because of turbulence. Over flat plains, they can go well above the clouds to 20 to 30,000 feet. But they usually don't because there has to be a reason for that. Just, it's too high for foraging when they're above the clouds. So they tend to center below 5,000 feet. But eagles have been recorded colliding with airplanes as high as 30,000 feet. It's the collisions of airplanes that indicate much of how high they go. And that's around 30,000 feet, usually the maximum that has been recorded. 
And then there's another question from Paul. Um, are there eagles in Australia? And if so, are they related to any of the other eagles? Yes, this, the wedge-tailed eagle. The wedge-tailed eagle is a very large eagle, but very uh, long-winged and long-legged. It's very, it's related to the golden eagle. It's Aquila, one the Aquila, genus Aquila. It's related to the golden eagle, tawny eagle, Veroxys eagle. Those are the true eagles with their feathers down to their toes. And that's a wedge-tailed eagle. It's a very large and dark eagle. It's very common in Australia and causes a lot of trouble. It's been recorded killing livestock and pets. So uh, then there's a question from uh, Jean. Uh, bald eagles are doing extremely well. Are there any other eagles also gaining in population? Are there particular eagles that are of concern for survival? Yes, uh, right now the eagles that are gaining in population are the golden eagle in North America, the golden eagle in Scotland, and the white-tailed eagle has been reintroduced to Scotland. It's doing quite well in Norway and Scotland. The golden eagle is being reintroduced in Europe and is being heavily protected. But the eagles that are getting rarer and rarer are some of the southern eagles where there's a strong, a strong, a strong amount of deforestation. For example, deforestation in, the, in South America is affecting the harpy eagle. It's also affecting the crowned eagle in Africa. So some of those eagles are very rare and are facing serious problems. The Indian spotted eagle as well, because those are mainly forest specialists. If they're generalists, they can react, but then this poisoning from hunting carcasses, food poisoning of uh, carcasses, all those things affect the eagle. But in general, the specialists are suffering more than the generalists. The bald eagle has a lot of rivers in Canada and the United States, so that's why it can survive. And there are laws protecting it that seem to be effective. But in other places where the laws are less effective, they are being threatened, especially by deforestation and poisoned carcasses when people shoot animals. And then also people shooting the eagle because the eagles kill livestock. And the laws are ineffective in Africa and South America and Southeast Asia mainly. And then there's a question from Leo, which eagle has the furthest migration? Um, well, most eagles go from the cold climate to the, to the um, equatorial belt. So they don't go really far. But I would say some eagles, like the tawny eagle, can start in Europe and end up in South Africa. Usually the longest migration routes are from Europe, and Eastern Europe, and Northern Europe through Africa, sometimes landing in South Africa. Like some tawny eagles and other species, which are found in Africa, are also found in Europe, and they find some migratory species, migratory individuals, among the local birds in South Africa. So, for example, a tawny eagle can start from Western Russia, or steppe eagle sometimes, and somehow land in South Africa, going down the Nile and going through the savannah, getting to Botswana area. So the longest migratory routes will be the European Aquila eagles, like steppe and tawny eagles, who, which can reach, go from Europe all the way into South Africa. Mm. But it's not very common. It's more individualist. Some land in Kenya, some even reach South Africa. We do get, uh, we do get um, these migrants every year, uh, at least a few. Um, Leo's also asking, what's your favorite eagle? Do you have a favorite eagle? Uh, my favorite eagle was the happy eagle because it's the largest and most powerful one. And most people consider the happy eagle the most charismatic eagle. It's peculiar in the size and strength and also with massive crests. So it's usually taken as, a, as the definitive tropical eagle with a crest. Hmm. Um, I'm not sure that I have a favorite eagle. That would be an interesting one to try and figure out. I think that's the last question. There's uh, lots okay. of uh, thank yous, uh, lots of people saying great uh, presentation, very informative, etc. And um, yeah, I think that's uh, that's a wrap. Okay. Yes. Um